Lighting's a little weird today, but we will endeavor to persevere. Let's see what happens. Hello, all you happy people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're getting started here, folks. We've got an action back day for you today, kids, to say the least. Uh, hi, this is Mike Myers, and welcome to the Monday edition of the Ask Mike Anything. So we do this twice a week. We do this Mondays, Central Time, Central Daylight Savings Time right now. And we do it on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. And uh, so hopefully we get a time slot that works for you guys every week. So welcome aboard. Uh, it's good to see everybody. I can't get my lighting right in here. So if I look a little ghosty, well, we'll all endeavor to persevere, shall we? Checking one, two. Sounds good. All right. So uh, today's show is all about... Um, virtual machines. Uh, we did take a little side trip on uh, VLANs there for a while, but we're back into the world of virtual machines today. Uh, this is going to be a multi-episode situation, but this will probably be the big one to start. We had a couple episodes before that kind of got the idea in our head, but today is the first day we're actually going to be working on real uh, virtual machines and getting stuff done. Keep in mind the goal of this series is to how to use virtual networking as a replacement for real networks because not all of us can string together you know, 18 different switches and six routers and do all kinds of fun stuff like that. So what we're going to be doing here is uh, we're going to be going through, well, it's an opinion piece of how much you can learn about networking using virtual machines and in particular virtual networks. So uh, before we get started, uh, do keep in mind that um, I, I, this is going to be designed eventually to be a self-standing course. And uh, so with that attitude in mind, I, I'm going to go through the, the main stuff and we'll save questions for the end, which can then be edited out. Uh, so we're starting here at 2 o'clock, and this will run for about 30 minutes, 40 minutes or so, I think. Uh, and uh, and then we'll wrap from there. I will have a question and answer period on the end, uh, but in particular, this is the beginning piece from which you should start constructing your virtual labs. And uh, so with that attitude of mind, let's dive in. For, well, before I do that, let me uh, look through anything here. See if there's any critical questions. Setting up a 90s era Doom LAN party with legacy equipment if the network will work on a modem switch or will it expect an old hub? The networking equipment will work on either a switch or a hub, Will. I don't know how retro you're going to get. You're like an old 10 base T network? <laughs> that would work. All right. Um, okay, so no critical questions. See a lot of my friends here. Andre, good to see you again today. Muhammad, good to see you. Tolowit, Patricia, Will. All right, so we have a small but quickly growing group. So. Folks, what I need you guys to do right now is uh, we've got a lot of presentation to do. So I'm going to need everybody to be working really, really hard, in particular, going through checklists as we determine what you need to start setting up your lab. So without further ado, let's just go diving into this. And uh, the best place to start is talking about what we actually need to do here. So let's just go ahead. I got a little presentation. I have set up for everybody here. And uh, let's just go ahead and look at this together. So before we even get started on this, there's a couple of things that need to be done. I'm hoping a lot of you guys have already done that, but if not, this is where you can come back to this video later and do these things. Number one, you need to install VirtualBox on your system. So make sure you have at least 16 gigs of RAM, more is better. Make sure the virtualization in the system startup. And for these demos, we're gonna be using VirtualBox version 7.0.6. Really important if you're going to be using VirtualBox. There is an older version of VirtualBox, the old 6 series, where you do not need CPU virtualization. I just so rare to see that anymore. Look, the bottom line is, is that if you've got a system that's four years, five years old or less, I could probably go six to seven years old or less, it's got CPU virtualization in it. In all probability, it's not turned on by default, which I'm not sure why they do that. Go into your system setup, you know, where you can reboot your computer, 
press delete or F2 or whatever it is, go in there, find your virtualization settings and turn them on. That's all you gotta do. If they're not turned on, VirtualBox will A, not even want to install, although you can force it to, and B, it absolutely will not run version seven. You have to use version six if you don't want to use CPU virtualization. There's no reason for you not to do that. Okay, uh, next, while we're on here. So uh, last one, I'm using version.7.0.6. I'm bringing that in just because VirtualBox versions change a lot and uh, that'll be a reference thing. Okay, the next thing I need you to do is, I need you to create two virtual machines. No, no matter what you create, use your default network settings. Don't even look at those settings. But we need some, we, we need some workstation type systems. So I, you can set up a Windows 10 system or a Windows 11 system or Ubuntu desktop. I mean, if you wanna use other versions of Linux, feel free, but uh, you won't be able to uh, use all the commands I'm using, that's up to you. Uh, for Ubuntu, I'm currently running the uh, LTS, the long-term service, whatever it stands for, version 22.04. Now look, when I tell you to set up two systems, and you're like, well, Mike, are you Windows 10 or Windows 11 or Ubuntu? I don't care, you can set up two Windows 10 systems. You can set up two uh, des Win uh, Ubuntu desktop systems. You can set up a Windows 11 system and Ubuntu. I don't care. Just make two of them, okay? And make sure you can do a couple of things. Number one, from either of those operating systems, make sure that you can run ping, okay? And from either one of those operating systems, make sure you can figure out what your IP settings are. Okay, uh, we're going to be doing that today on both of them. So if you don't know how to do that on both uh, either Windows or uh, Ubuntu desktop, well, you're about to learn in this session. So either way is good. All right, so you create two VMs. We will make more VMs later, but I need two for starters. And then last, if you're going to be running Windows, you got to do two things in that uh, virtual machine. Number one, I need you to turn off Windows Firewall. And number two, install internet information services. The reason, and you're gonna do the same thing for Linux, but it's easier in Linux. The reason I need you to do this is, number one, Windows does a really good job of blocking just about everything with the firewall turned on, which is what it's supposed to do, but we're gonna be running in a very uh, uh, secluded environment so we can safely go without our uh, Windows firewall on, on our virtual machines. Secondly, I want to be able to access another system. Now, there's a lot of different ways I could access another system. Uh, for example, I could do file and print sharing and share a folder, although that's a little hairy to do in a Linux box because I'd have to light up Samba, which is outside of the scope of what I want to do. Uh, I could just ping each other, but that's boring. I mean, we're definitely gonna ping each other. But whether that, I'd like to have some service running we could look at. So what we're gonna do is both on the Windows boxes and on the Linux boxes, we're gonna be running a web server. Okay, that's it. Nothing special. It just gives me something more if I wanna go access, you know, system, you know, 10.11.12.14. I want to do something more than just ping. Is everybody cool with this? So I'm just going to schlep up a web server. Windows has a default web server. Most every version of uh, uh, Linux has default web servers. So if they're already there and ready to install, why don't we just light them up? That's the whole idea, all right? So some of you guys may not have installed uh, IIS. We're going to go through that too. But first of all, let's make sure you know how to turn off your firewall in Windows. All right, so... Uh, Let's go ahead and get in here. So what I've done here is I've lit up the control panel and under and there's an option, Windows Defender Firewall. And all I did is I turned off the firewall. So if I see lots of red here, that makes me happy because it's not gonna be blocking stuff. Then if you want to install IIS, all you do is go back into the control panel, go to uh, Windows Programs and Features uh, that's I'm in programs and features here. And on the left-hand side, turn Windows features on or off. And when you click on that, this little box comes up and just hit Internet Information Services. It won't light up everything, but what it doesn't light up, you don't need for what we're doing right now. Now, on Ubuntu, they have a little basic Python web server that's built into it. And to access that, you just run this command from a terminal. 
So Python 3 space minus M space HTTP.server space and then the port number, which in this case is going to be 8080. You might want to jot that down while you get a chance. Uh, but that is the tool we're going to be using when we want, when I want to access an Ubuntu machine, I don't want to just ping it. I want to do something with it so I know it's there. So I'm going to light up a web server on the uh, Ubuntu side as well. Folks, there's nothing special about the way I've chosen to do this. If you wanted to do something else, I wouldn't care. Like for example, if you wanted to use a different kind of web server, I don't care. Just IIS is built into Windows and this Python 3 mini server is built into Linux boxes. If you wanted to set up FTP servers, I don't care. Just you need some kind of server thing running so we don't got something more to do than just ping here, people. Okay. So let us march on here. And the important thing we need to talk about at this point is virtual machine LAN types. Now we've had a discussion on it, but in this episode, we're actually going to be setting them up and configuring them. So we've got <coughs> a bridge LAN, we've got internal networks, we've got NAT, a NAT network, what's the difference? I'll show you. And then what I call and the rest. And we're going to start setting these all up right now. So with any luck, you have a copy of VirtualBox in front of you, you've got it lit up, and uh, you've already made some virtual machines. All right, so here's my little network here in the house. And uh, that black, the box right there is actually my box that I'm running from right now. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner there, that's my upstream router, and it's passing out 172.18.13. whatever addresses from a DHCP server. Pretty standard stuff for a home network. Now, with a bridged LAN, all of your virtual machines, so uh, here I am setting up some virtual machines, all of these virtual machines literally piggyback off of your uh, network card itself. So they're going to be acting like they are also on the 172.18.13 network. So they're going to get IP addresses from the same DHCP server you did. So they're on the same broadcast domain as your host. There's an absolutely great way to do it. So let's go ahead and connect on our bridge network. Now guys, we're going to be going into VirtualBox like three different ways here, configuring different networks. The biggest secret to remember when you're working with any form of virtual machines is documentation. I live with a pen and paper when I'm working with this stuff because we're going to be setting up one lab one way and I'm going to have these IP addresses and I'm going to give it this name and whatever it is. It is very common for me to, uh, before I start doing any form of configuration whatsoever, is I'm going to start drawing out my rounded rectangles and I'm going to start writing the IP address ranges in those rectangles, giving them names, doing any kind of documentation I need so I don't mess this up because you will mess it up. Shoot, folks, I have gone through this thing about five times already, and I'm very confident I know how to do all these configurations. Almost guarantee we'll have a mess up here today. But remember, documentation is absolutely key. All right, so we want to go ahead and connect on our bridge network. So let's go ahead and do that. So what you're looking at here is my default virtual box. And I've got a couple of systems running. Now, one of the nice things that you got to remember about VirtualBox is that once a virtual machine is up and running, you're kind of stuck with whatever hardware you set up. Okay? Like, you can't add more memory. In general, you cannot add more memory to a virtual machine that's actually up and running. The one thing you can do, and this works for pretty much all Type 2 or Type 2-esque hypervisors, is that you can change the networking on the fly which is kind of convenient. So let keep that in mind as we go through this. Let's go ahead and start off. What I want to do is I'm going to go into the Ubuntu system and I'm going to make sure it's set to bridge networking. Then I'm going to go to the Windows system and then I'm going to make sure it's set to bridge networking. Now once I've done that, I should be able to, we should be able to ping each other at the very least. Now keep in mind, when I set it to bridged, bridged networking, if it isn't on there already, there might have to be some resolution time, or I might have to do a reboot on the system or something like that. So do keep that in mind. In general, you don't have to. In general, if a system's network connection has changed, it knows it and automatically tries to 
reconfigure itself. Okay, so for starters here, what we're going to do is we're going to set up bridge networking on our two virtual machines. One's going to be Linux, one's going to be uh, Windows. I will tell you that my DHCP server here for the studio is passing out 172.18.13 addresses. So I will know I have it right if I'm getting 172.18.13. Now people sit there and go, Mike, where did 172.18.13 come from? Because when I set my network up, when I set up the studio three years ago, I decided that all the internal devices in the studio are going to be 172.18.13. And I set up a little internal router to pass out 172.18.13 addresses on DHCP. That's how I know, all right? So this computer, my studio computer, is just one computer on that 172.18.13 network. I've added two virtual machines. Now let's get to them. And by using bridge networking, let's make sure that they get 172.18.13 addresses. Here we go. So I'm going to start off with, uh, here's the Ubuntu desktop system. You see it says running right there. And I'm just going to go over to settings, down to network. And right now it is already pre-configured for bridged adapter. So with any luck, we should be OK. So I'm just going to cancel out of that. Here's the Windows 10 system. You also you can see as a green arrow shows it's running network. OK, it's on a bridged adapter as well. You'd almost think I did that on purpose. So if I've done everything like I said I would, like for example on the Windows system, if I have turned off the firewall and if I've got a uh, IIS running, we should be able to go from the Linux system and A, first I'm going to try to ping the Windows system and then B, I'm going to try to open up a web browser. So let's give that a try. First thing I want to do is I'm going to go onto the Windows system and let's verify its IP address. So here we go. So the Windows 10 system is always running, already running. It's down here. Here, I'll make this full screen. <coughs> All right, so there's a thousand different ways to check an IP address here. Uh, the two ones I want you to be aware of is we're going to go into Control Panel, and then we're going to go down to uh, Network and Sharing Center, Change Adapter Settings. So here's my connection, and I'm going to go to its properties, and here I'm going to look under IPv4, and right now it says obtain an address automatically and everything like that. Just because my virtual machine is piggybacking on my NIC, and that NIC is connected to a network which passes 172.18.13s out, you can't assume that the virtual machine you just installed is going to do that too. The virtual machine has to be set up for DHCP and all that stuff. Does that make sense? Okay. I could just as easily statically type in 172.18.13.65, hoping there's no one else who's 65, and I could put myself on the network that way as well. But right now it's set up automatically. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to a command prompt. Yeah, I'm using CMD. Don't tease me. And I'm just going to do an IP config. See if I actually spelled it right. There's only one P in IP config. All right, we take a look. And if you see right here, I've got a 172.18.13.106. I'm actually going to write that down, 106, to help me remember that for later. OK. So now, that's fun. Let's go over to the Linux machine, which is also running. And let's see how he's set up. So I went in the upper right-hand corner and, and brought this window up. Take a little peek here. It's got a 172.18.13.100. Let me write that down. 100 is its end address. But in theory, if I've got this set up right, yep, it was set up automatic DHCP. So this information is coming from somewhere. Yeah, it's dot, dot .100. Okay, interesting enough. Okay, so I've set my two virtual machines up to a bridge network, and it looks like they both got a 172.18.13 address, which is how this is supposed to work. Now keep in mind that these two virtual machines are on the same network as my system. If I, for example, wanted to play with um, Kali Linux, 
and I started, I, I set up a virtual machine with Kali Linux in it, and I start doing this hackery stuff, I'm exposing my actual network to it. The real network that's presenting to you right now. This could all go away, right? So using a bridge network haphazardly is not necessarily a good idea, folks. It's easy to make mistakes. But for right now, let's just see and verify we can get on that bridge network. Okay, so I know uh, that my Windows system is on uh, 106, and I have IIS running. So I, if you've never seen what IIS looks like by default, let me just do this right here within Windows. So ignore that. So if I've done it right, there you go. Do you see that screen? these pretty blue squares, this is the default IIS screen that you get when you first install IIS. You can put your own uh, uh, index page in there you want, but when you see that, you know you've connected to somebody else's IIS. That's all we're trying to do right, th uh, right there. All right, so this is on Windows, and that was 106. I typed in here. I, it, people are like, how did you type that? Isn't that its own IP address? Yeah, I could also type this. 127.0.0.1, you get the same result, ba -doom. all right, okay. So now we're gonna go over to the other system. Let me actually see if I, can I leave this Windows system running a little bit here? And we go over to the Ubuntu system now. And I'm gonna open up a browser. And now this time I'm gonna type in the Windows IP address, 172.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
when we're playing with networks in in virtual in the virtualized world. So, but you do have to watch what's going to happen here. So, what's going to take place is. So here's going to be my one little network, network one. And then the moment I type in a two, it's going to be, there'll be a second network two. It doesn't delete network one. It just makes a new network called network two. I didn't have to call it network two. I called it, called it, could have called it Timmy the Wonder Poodle. The name doesn't matter, okay? But what does matter is whatever system I type that into is now going to be a member of that network. So let's create some internal network. Sure, why not? Now, before we get into internal networks, understand that most of the more interesting labs that we're going to be doing here are going to be in internal networks. I can have basically a unlimited number of internal networks. And uh, it, works, it works really well. So things for like dynamic routing protocols, uh, playing with DHCP, playing with DNS, playing with uh, layer two tunneling protocols, playing with all kinds of stuff. A lot of time, basic routing. A lot of times on a virtual on, on on a virtual machine, setting it to an internal network, and just you just put all of the devices that you want to play with for that particular lab in that particular internal network. No, they don't have internet access. Okay, there's ways we can do that, but for so many labs, if I'm just trying to teach somebody how to do something simple. I don't even need internet access. Who cares whether it has internet access or not? Okay, there's other stuff I might care, but we'll talk about those too. All right. So if we're gonna set up an internal network, basically what that says is that we really have to configure the machines completely on our own. Uh, I could, if I wanted to, like install a system with a a router in it or something like that, but we're way outside of the scope of that for right now. So all I want to do right now is I'm going to go into each one of my systems. I'm going to make sure they're on the same network, internal network, and then I'm just going to give them a static IP address and just see if we can ping. If we can just ping each other, I'm happy that we're on the same address. So let's go ahead and get started on that right now. All right, so I'm going to pick, uh, it doesn't really matter. Let's go into the virtualization settings first. Here's the Ubuntu desktop. I'm going to go into settings and I'm going to go into network and I'm going to change it from bridged to internal network. <clears throat> and I've got, I already made a network one. There's usually a default one. It'll have like a name like INET or something like that. So I've gone ahead and the Ubuntu machine is now on an internal network called network one. I'm going to go do the same thing with the Windows system. And whoops. Yeah, that's right. Network one. By putting the two systems on network one, it's as though I have just snapped them into the same switch. Yep. So right now, by default, both of these devices are configured for DHCP. I have just plugged them in. They're the only two computers that exist. There is no router. There is no internet connection. There's no DHCP server. So if I want these guys to ping, I'm going to have to have them uh, type in, I'm going to have to give them an IP address. So I'm going to arbitrarily give them 192.168.88.x. And I write it down so I'll remember because I'm really bad at remembering these things. And now I got to go into each one of these. So, <laughs> so let, let's just go into each of these and get them configured. All right. So, boom, boom, boom. So here's my Windows system, and I'm going to give it a static IP address. So as always, I'm just going to go into Control Panel. Yes, there's other ways to get there, but this is the way I know how to do it. I'm going to go into Change Adapter Settings, Properties. I'm going to TCP IP v4, and I'm going to use, this time I'm going to type in a manual address. Uh, 192.168. What did I say? 88. 88. Uh, 100, and then I'll give it a subnet mask that uh, knows smart enough to know how to do that by itself. I'm going to write down 100 right now, so I don't forget that that's why I put a Windows system. Notice I'm not even worried about default gateway or DNS. Folks, all I'm trying to do at this point is make sure that they have uh, st static addresses in the 192.168.88 range and that they're able to ping each other. I have no interest in getting out on the internet. I don't care about any of that. <clears throat> all right. 
Windows system set up. Let's head over to the Ubuntu box. And Ubuntu, there's so many different ways to do this. I'm going to go into wired settings, the upper inner corner. Dun, 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 dun. So I just removed the connection profile. I'm going to make a new one. Uh, the MAC address is going to be my default MAC address, IPv4. I'm going to set it to manual, and I'm going to type in 192.168.88.203. So one was 100, the other is 203, writing that down, so I don't forget. Netmask 255, oh god, I hate Linux sometimes. And I'm pretty sure that that will be all I need. So I've gone into the Windows system and configured it as 192.168.88.100 and I went into the Linux system and I configured it as 192.168.88.203. Let's see if they can ping. Here we go, kids. All right, let me just whip up a terminal here. And ping 192.168.88.100. No, 100 is the window system. Oh, you're writing down. Yay, so I'm getting successful pings. Do you guys see that? So I got a successful ping. Uh, if I want to, I can go ahead over to the window system. Where do the window system go? Don't tease me about my messy desktop. Let me get to a command prompt. I got one running from before. And I'm going to type in ping 192.168.88. What did I call Linux system 203? Thank goodness I wrote it down. And I get replies. Do you know how hard it is to get to this point? <laughs> Using virtual machines to learn about networking is a great tool. However, it has some shortcomings. To me, the biggest single shortcoming is I don't have physical pieces of hardware in front of me for everything, and sometimes that could lead to confusion, even in relatively simple setups. So, this is why your notepad is going to really come into play and drawing your rounded rectangles and saying, this is network one, or this is network two, this is passing out 172.18. You can see where I'm coming from? Diagramming your stuff is so important that it, any lab I do, that's going to be like step one and two is proper diagramming. All right. But anyway, so we are successful. Now everybody's like, well, my God. Is it? Ping's important. I mean, 99% of all the problems I run into in networking, I can fix with IP config. On the Linux side, it would be IP space ADDR and ping. Yeah, sorry guys. I know you think we're going to use some Kali Linux to do something scary and amazing, but most of the time, just getting two systems to work on an internal network and pinging together are nice. Be warned, folks. You're going to see a lot more of these internal networks. Um, we do a ton of work using these things. However, it's not the only game out there. So I want to show you one more, or actually two more at once. All right, so let's take a look at this. So the third one is actually two kinds of networks at the same time. Uh, what uh, VirtualBox calls NAT, or NAT networks. So the difference is very subtle. I'll show you. All right, so here on the left-hand side is my usual internal network. And now here, I've got a couple of machines in their own virtual machines. These are virtual machines on the right-hand side. But with a NAT network, what I'm doing is my host machine's kind of acting like its own little router. And the, the it will be passing out a particular range of addresses. So in this particular example, it's passing out 10.0.2s. Don't forget what NAT is all about. NAT allows you to take one public IP address and split it up so you can share it among X number of theoretically private IP addresses on an internal network. That's what NAT is all about. So 
One of the reasons that VirtualBox adds a NAT network is because, well, oh, and by the way, this NAT network will go ahead and still connect you to the internet. It'll use your host machine and the host machine will go through and connect to the internet. The big difference is, is whereas bridge networking just gets that whatever IP address everybody else gets from your DHCP server, with a NAT network, assuming you turn on DHCP server, and most of us do, it basically emulates a home network. It emulates the router functions, it acts as a DHCP server, and it's passing out NAT addresses. When you're configuring, you have two options. There's NAT and NAT network. The difference is subtle. So with NAT, you just get the default NAT. So VirtualBox comes with a default NAT network out of the box, which is 10.0.2. And if you set it to NAT, that's what you're gonna get. If you set it to NAT network, it lets you choose other NATs. So let's go ahead and create an alternative NAT network. Now you've noticed pretty much everything we've done up to this point, really just matter of us changing options under the network settings of our virtual machines, right? Well, there is another place to go and I wanna show that to you right now. There we go. All right, so here we are back in, here, man, the noise that. Here we are uh, back in the uh, virtual box. And what I want you to do is up here at, where it says tools, do you see this? In the super up at right hand corner. And then there's a little radio box next to it. You hit that and you'll see an option that says network. And when you come into the network, you've got three tabs. Host only networks, NAT networks, and cloud networks. For right now, I only want to talk about uh, NAT networks. So you can see that by default, we have a NAT called 10.0.2. And you can actually see everything it passes out. It might be a little tough to read. I wish I had some easy magnifying function in here. Not that weird Windows magnifying. I don't know what that would do. But anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another NAT network. And uh, I'm going to call it Timmy the Wonder Poodle. All right, because it doesn't matter what you call it, even if there's typos. And here I can type in what IPv prefix I want. So I can do a 10.0.4.0, WAC24. That's the way they want it configured. And then enable DHCP. I can enable IPv6 if I want but I would have to put in a really uh, good prefix. Can I do this off the top of my head? So I did a 2001-444, and then I wanted to do route advertisements. So I hit yes, does it buy it? And somewhere in there I typed the IPv6 uh, I, I typed in the IPv6 prefix wrong, so I'm not gonna hassle with that. I didn't actually plan for that today. I was just going for it. But what you can see now is I've created a NAT network called 10.0, well, it's called Timmy the Wonder Poodle, but it's gonna be passing out 10.0.4 addresses. So now we can just go back. Let's go back over to Ubuntu, for example, and I'm gonna go back into network settings. And under network, I, this time I'm gonna select, if I select NAT, it just grays out. That's because it's sending me to whatever that default uh, NAT network is for uh, VirtualBox, which is going to be 10.0.2. And that's just the default one that always comes with. Now, if I go down to NAT network, now I can actually choose which NAT network I want to use. So I can use the default one, 10.0.2, or I can use Timmy the Wonder Poodle. So you can see why people, when they're working with NAT networks in VirtualBox, is they actually put the network ID as part of the name. You don't have to do that as a law of physics. It just makes it a lot easier when I'm trying to pick between NAT 10.0.2, and I'd be like, Timmy the Wonder Poodle, what is that passing out? I don't remember. So I probably could have called it Timmy the 10.0.4 and made my life a little bit easier. But there's no laws of physics there. 
Okay, so the important thing about NAT versus NAT networks is that uh, they do separate your virtual machines from the rest of the world, okay? Uh, so that would be, uh, uh, you know, we can already do that with the individual networks, but we can't get on the internet at least easily using individual private networks. So what we do instead is we think, of, well, let's use a bridge network. Bridge networks will allow you to get on, will allow your virtual machines to get on the internet. However, they will expose your virtual machines to everything that your regular computers are exposed to. So using NAT is often the choice when we want to have a few virtual machines and maybe a server doing whatever they're doing, but we need them to have an opportunity to get out to the internet for, I don't know, driver updates or whatever it might be. So NAT networks can be a very, very attractive option, okay? So bridged, uh, bridge networks, hold on. Bridge networks, internal networks, and then uh, NAT networks, okay? But there are a few more. Which I lovingly call, and the rest. So, and the rest, there we go. Got to do the Professor and Mary Ann, of course, because that's, every time I think about that, that's where it came from. But really what we're talking about is there's some other network options I don't use them, but let me explain why, because it will bother you if I don't tell you. Number one, host-only adapter. The host-only adapter looks a lot like the NAT network, but uses a virtual NIC in the host system as opposed to the actual host system's NIC itself. Yeah, well, that's what the support documentation said to me, too. What I can tell you is that uh, with VirtualBox, when you install VirtualBox, it puts a virtual network card into your network settings that's called the host-only adapter. The difference between the host-only adapter, oh, and by the way, it passes out DHCP and everything. It looks exactly like a NAT network to me. I can't really tell what the difference is, so that speaks volumes right there. Generic driver, generic driver allows you like to configure like the different type of network card you're using, all this stuff. It's for backward compatibility. I've never seen anybody use it in the last seven or eight years. Cloud network, now this is experimental, but pretty cool. I haven't had a chance to really play with this yet, but in theory with VirtualBox, and I'm sure uh, VMware does it too, I did not see it in Hyper-V, is that instead of connecting to virtual machines locally on your computer here, that in theory we could have a, a cloud account someplace and that we can spin up virtual machines and all that on the cloud and not eating up all of our computer space. Do I like that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of cute. Uh, I don't like the fact that the network going down prevents me from getting work done. Whereas if I, if I just use the traditional machines, I could still work. <sighs> but it, it does have some real promise. I haven't played with it yet, guys, so I can't tell you anything about uh, cloud network at this point. And the last one is not attached. Not attached is exactly like it says. It ain't connected to nothing. And you might say to yourself, well, Mike, why would I ever want that? Well... Sometimes you just want to disconnect something because you don't know where you want to put it to next. So by disconnecting it, that can be helpful to you. Uh, but the other thing is, is a lot of times it's kind of interesting uh, installing operating systems, certain types of applications that really want to call home. See if they, how they work in a completely isolated environment. So kind of interesting, huh? All right, so it's uh, we got we've got only got about 15 minutes left. So uh, this is what I wanted to get covered today. Um, I if you're following along, at, you should by next Wednesday, two days from now, you should have VirtualBox up and running. You should have at least two virtual machines running. You should be able to jump between internal uh, internal NAT and bridged, and just be able to make the things ping each other. That's all I'm asking. Just make them ping or at least look at each other's uh, web browser, you know, with a web browser. Uh, these basic underpinnings 
as we move forward and other labs going forward, I'm not going to repeat this stuff. So I'm going to be counting on you to remember if I say use an internal network that you'll have an internal network ready to run. Especially when we bring in software routers, folks, we're going to have a router with two network cards in it. And one of the network cards is going to connect to one network and the other one's going to connect to another. And that's how we're going to get practical routing done. So having this very organized and very cleaned up will really, really help you a lot. All right, uh, I have not checked to see if there's any questions or anything for quite some time. I hope I'm still in the air. Uh, all right, so. All right, looks like nobody has any questions. Wow. Does this virtual manager uh, come with Windows OS? No. Uh, who, who was this? Doxter? What we're talking about is a very famous Type 2 hypervisor called VirtualBox. VirtualBox comes from a company called Oracle. VirtualBox is completely free. So it works out real good. I, and I hope, yeah. Oh, well, you already got it answered for me. I always, Techie Tommy, I always need a nap, Techie Tommy. I like permanently need a nap. Uh, would you recommend setting up a Windows virtual network on my Mac or should I just buy use Windows to learn the OS? The problem is, is I am not an expert at running on a Mac platform. It is my understanding, uh, Doxter, that you can use VirtualBox on Macs and that it shouldn't be changing anything in terms of the interface and you should be able to march right along with us uh, without any problems whatsoever. Dave or somebody, can you double check and verify that VirtualBox runs on Macs? I'm highly confident it does, but I don't want to. Would you recommend setting up a Windows? Okay, we got that one. Uh, Luca, I have one. Is this an open source software or free? It is both open source and free if we're talking about VirtualBox, right? Okay, so it, the other thing you got to remember uh, with VirtualBox is uh, with VirtualBox, you, you set up a virtual machine, all right? And then you install the operating system. That means you're going to have to download an ISO, either a Windows ISO or a Ubuntu ISO, and you install it just like you were installing a real system itself. And then uh, once it's installed, uh, you usually have to go through an extra step with VirtualBox, and they have what are called VM uh, additions. Let's see if I can actually show this to you. It's going to be a little small, but let me see if I can bring this up on a screen. So this is uh, Windows running in a virtual machine. So up here under Devices, you'll see this option that says, Insert guest, guest, let's try again. Insert guest edition CD image. And when you do that, what it's going to do, let's close all this. I'm just staying within the virtual machine here. So I go into this PC and you'll see what it did here is it installed VirtualBox guest editions. You probably want to go ahead and install those. VMware guest editions do, VMware, who, sorry, VirtualBox guest editions, they do nice little things. Like for example, you can move the cursor outside of a virtual machine and back into your host desktop without hitting certain keys. Um, the CD editions allows better uh, sound functions where you can actually play videos like within the virtual machine and it works. Uh, it helps with USB devices. It helps with some scrolling and scaling stuff. You know, keep in mind, you're going to be running lots of little windows, which are individual computers. And I like the ability, VirtualBox is the only one that I know that has this, where you can scale it, 
where basically depending on how small you make the window, it'll readjust the resolution on the fly, which I find extremely convenient. Uh, but you probably are going to need to install those uh, VirtualBox guest editions. All right, guys. So what I expect everybody to do between now and Wednesday, get VirtualBox installed, get at least two virtual machines up and running. All right. I don't care if you use Windows or Ubuntu or one Ubuntu and one Linux or two Windows or I don't care. Just make sure you know how to ping and make sure you can configure um, how to uh, uh, what else? Ping, 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 and know what your network uh, I, uh, information is. So as long as you know how to do that, we're in good shape. We've done both of those for both Linux and Windows today. So hopefully you'll be in good shape about knowing where that information is. Um, get those up and cooking and jump between some of the different types of network connections. By doing that, when we come back on Wednesday, we're gonna start bringing some real tools into play here and show you how you can do some really fun configurations to start learning a lot about networking. And it's gonna be a lot of fun. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up. Let me make sure no other questions snuck in at the last second. Yeah, virtual, uh, thank you, Andre, for double checking. VirtualBox does run on Macs. All right. All right, well, guys, I hope you guys found this one uh, uh, useful and, and interesting. Uh, when I get back on Wednesday, we're going to start doing a few more labs now, now that we have the basic tools. And we're just going to keep running through and eventually, we're gonna have some virtual routers come into play and uh, really have a lot of fun. And the end of all this, fingers crossed, I'm going to set up a BGP network and we're actually going to do uh, BGP dynamic routing. <laughs> fingers crossed, no guarantees on that one. All right guys, I'm out the door here. Y'all have a great uh, afternoon or evening. I will see you guys on Wednesday. Until then, this is your little Uncle Mikey saying bye-bye. Have fun with all that virtualization. <laughs>